This is good news of the gospel. Sometimes the good news of the gospel is challenging. How is that good news? When I was a child, the best news that could have possibly happened started with a knock at the door. It didn't ever happen, but I hoped it was going to happen. It seemed real. I'd seen on the TV where there'd been a knock at the door and someone went and opened it, and who was standing there? Ed McMahon. <laughs> Publishers clearing a house sweepstakes with a million dollar check, and that to me seemed like a real possibility. We have a door. Sometimes people knock on it. And mom, in the parade section, again, there's a thing for you to fill out. Like, why are you not on this? This should be your first thing that you do. Get us in that sweepstakes. That's what good news, good news would look like. It would be enriching my life. As silly as that sounds, I think there's a part of us that still has elements of that in how we understand what good news is. Something that is going to enrich our lives. Pause there for a second. Is it for the mutual upbuilding of the body? When you think of the best news, is it what will build up the body of Christ? That's the best news, I promise. And sometimes it's hard news. Sometimes mm, you're not so much the beneficiary as the one who's being told to repent and change so that the body can be built up and grow. And sometimes this one that you've been waiting for, the Messiah, you worship, you pray. Sometimes he says, oh, I, my attention is over here. You need to meet me there. He shows up in his hometown and they say, just, just do what you did in Capernaum. Well, actually... They don't even say it. Jesus kind of picks a fight. This is, he doesn't do this often. But he says, no doubt you're going to say. And they're like, I wasn't going to say that. And he's, he comes up with a proverb that wasn't very well known, but it worked for his illustration. And uh, yeah, he knew that they were going to be mad. It was almost like, all right, let's get this over with. Because I am not who they think I am. As soon as I say that this has been fulfilled in your hearing, the understanding of the Messiah at that time and place meant a different kind of liberation. A salvation was being saved politically. Set the captives free to the people in his hometown meant setting their relatives who were indeed oppressed and under the boot of the Roman army, setting them free, you can empath or sympathize with that audience. It was a message that resonated much more closely probably to the gathering than it does with a lot of us. Me who doesn't know what food insecurity feels like, me who has never spent a long time in prison. <laughs> that, was, that one didn't work. <laughs> a significant amount of time in prison. I was a chaplain. That's what I was referring to. Who has not been oppressed. So that word is even the part from Isaiah. It, it's directed his mission that he is declaring. I'm not the primary recipient, beneficiary of that. It is a strange, hard thing for Christians to get their mind around that God is a God of the oppressed. But this wasn't my idea or some theologian in an ivory tower. It's, it's in this book over and over again. It's Jesus' words. This is what I'm here for. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It is Mary's Magnificat. Over and over again, there is a preferential option for the poor, for the widow, for the stranger. 
and for the orphan, none of which I am. Some of you do know what that's like. The good news in that for those of us that maybe can't locate ourselves in some of those groupings is God is also inviting us into those spaces. I see it more as if you meet me there, this is where I am and this is where you will encounter me. Whenever you do it for the least of these, you do it for me. Lord, when did we see you? Whenever you did it for the least of these. Lord, when did we see you? When you went among those who were oppressed, when you were with the widow, the orphan, when you welcomed the stranger, I was there, you were with me. So it's still good news because it's an invitation, it's an opportunity to move into those sacred spaces. But before we paint it too much with rose-colored lenses or look at it with rose-colored lenses, I think putting it into vernacular or colloquialisms, this message of who this is for is probably worthwhile. Jesus comes back and we're all like Presbyterians, so we're at the front of the line, obviously. And Jesus says, uh, pardon me, and he wades through us, through the midst of us, just like he did then. He just passed right by us, didn't he? John Thomas, was that Jesus? Yes, that was. Okay. Did he tell you anything? Didn't talk to me. And Jesus told someone. Oh, I'm going to where the undocumented migrants are, where children are not safe anymore. I'm going to where the prostitutes are. And then Peter says, sex, they're called sex workers now. And Jesus says, I'm going to where the sex workers now, where they are. I mean, it, that's how it lands. I mean, that's, that's the message. That's Jesus naming what he is here for. To change how the world is. To make things right as God intended. You know, when God first created, a new creation is being inaugurated. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. These things we have to change for this to be heaven on earth. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about. And that's why it's still good news for us because we are also captive to a world where there is injustice. Because in our hearts, we know that something isn't right. And it comes in between us and God. It's hard to figure out where we're missing the mark, where God is telling us to be that outrages us. It takes a very humble person to be able to hear that message, and every now and then I come across people that do it brilliantly, and I am in awe of them. They're able to hear something that they adamantly oppose, and then we're able to receive the Spirit, oftentimes by going into that space that was most distressing. A preacher who doesn't challenge a congregation is just lying to his congregation. He or she is not telling the truth, not pointing out that, hey, y'all, this isn't the kingdom of God, this isn't heaven on earth, and it's not because all the other people, if everybody would just act like us that are gathered here today, it would be heaven on earth. We all know that. Am I right? Fist bump? No, we know. Come on. And who goes to a class just to hear things they already know and believe? Like, why would you go to sit in front of a teacher that won't tell you anything that's different than what you thought? Church has to get stronger there, I believe. And trust that Words proclaimed are proclaimed in love, even if they are challenging. 
We are so scared of conflict. We want to do things that bring people together, right? That's beautiful. We do want to do things that bring people together. Heaven forbid we, heaven forbid we talk about vaccination and whether that has anything to do about being loving because that might, that might upset some people. Well, should we, can we have that conversation? So far, we haven't been ready to. Can we talk about it and still love each other at the end if we end up in a different place? My goodness, it seems like it might be worth talking about. If we love each other, hey, let's just have the conversation. It'll probably better equip us to deal with our families and our friends and understand each other. In a much more uh, dangerous in a time where there was so much fear and hate, uh, whenever that, those times are, there is always a voice that wants to just settle things, like find a homeostasis again. Institutions by nature do not like a bunch of change. They don't do well with change, and so they try to find the status quo. When Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. went to Birmingham, and he marched. Well, a bunch of clergy, a rabbi took out an editorial in the paper. It was called A Call for Unity. A Call for Unity. And then they went on to say that, oh, we're for civil rights. We just don't like uh, how you're doing it. They focused on methodology. I, that's generally or oftentimes, I've seen it with my own eyes, a cop out. Oh, I'm all for that. I'm for these people who have been oppressed. I just think we should, uh, should have approached it differently. Okay. Were you approaching it differently? <laughs> oh, we weren't even. Okay. A call for unity forgets that many, the people that are being advocated for, are not apart, that that's the whole point. They called Dr. King and the other civil rights marchers disturbers of peace. What kind of peace is it when it requires somebody to be broken and hurt and suffering and us to turn a blind eye? I don't want to have that peace. That's not peace. That's a lie. What's the hard word the Spirit wants you to hear? What's something that has been off-putting for decades that perhaps is a space that Jesus is calling you to, or at least it's worth a try to see? It's hard to know what those things are. It's, we stand boldly in what we believe, and that's, that's good, but we also stand humbly in what we believe, reformed and always reforming, open to the new thing the Spirit is doing. We say we want to work on race and reconciliation. We have these beautiful statements from the denomination. Some of us put yard signs in our yard. We want to have services with a sister congregation. We've done that. Oh, this is fantastic. But sometimes when it comes to taking a stand, sticking our neck out, uh, well, that's too close. Let's, we can't do that. That's going to hurt some people's feelings. Some people are going to get mad. We, we just shouldn't do that because it's more important for us all to be okay. A year and a half ago, a year and a half ago, some of the black clergy in town wrote a letter. Leadership, my wife included, who's not black, just had to clarify. She was the one white person who was a part of it. 
Renaissance uh, Lionel was also a part of helping with the letter. Our sister church, Renaissance Presbyterian, who we love and care about. And then they asked us, asked me, will you join us in this? In this call for justice here. Not in a general sense that we need to do things better among how uh, we treat people of color. We can do better here. And so it named example after example, egregious statement, statement after egregious statement, hire of someone who had been already committed police brutality after another person being hired for that. And it was addressed to Officer Hammond. That was infuriating to some people. I still love you. Why do you think that landed and rubbed people so, so wrong? Why do we want these combined services? We want to stand with our siblings in Christ who are people of color, but when it comes to naming something that is hurting them, if it's too close to home, hmm, let's just not talk about it. If we're not going to talk about the things that actually happen here, then why are we talking about it at all? If you don't name how it is happening here on our street or in our houses or in my life or to the people that are in our community, then let's stop saying platitudes. Jesus was talking about actual people. He was talking about Naaman and Zarephath. He was talking about people who needed healing. I think we're so scared that if someone says something that we disagree with, that, that that means that they don't value us as a person. I don't know how we can do that better, but I know we can. I know that's what Christians are called to do. And that's how we grow. Governor Wallace had said, it is regrettable that public disparagement of law and order has encouraged violence which has fallen on the innocent. When we're outraged about the methodology and not about what's causing the suffering, when we're outraged about someone else getting their feelings hurt, I think we're missing it. So your space might not be that, this thing with Officer Hammond. But do pay attention, because it got the Attorney General's attention. If the federal government is concerned about your sheriff, it might be worth taking a second look. But that might not be the space that right now you need to go into, that you're being pushed and challenged to go into. It could be with a loved one. There's probably somewhere that is very uncomfortable. And it's definitely a space where Christ is waiting for us. So I pray that you might find that, that you might be open to that, whatever it may be. Be bold. Live boldly, but live humbly. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.